Plant-based uh, gas turbine power generation units, uh, such as the one that is shown here, typically operate at a constant speed and constant load. So they more or less operate at the design operating conditions. And uh, departures from design operating conditions are very rare and usually not, uh, uh, not allowed. So consequently, uh, these are very, very efficient. Now, in contrast, in the case of an aircraft engine, uh, departure from uh, design operating condition is uh, unavoidable because the engine typically uh, produces the maximum amount of thrust uh, during takeoff and takes in maximum amount of air also during takeoff, typically around 1200 kilogram per second. And the thrust requirement decreases as the altitude increases and at a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet or so, the thrust level also decreases and the mass flow rates typically would be around 600 uh, kilogram per second or even less than that depending on the size of the engine. So uh, because of the huge variation in the ambient conditions as well as the mass flow requirements and thrust requirements of the engine, uh, off design operating conditions actually uh, are inevitable in the case of uh, in the case of an aircraft engine so the engine needs to be able to handle this in a robust and efficient manner uh, so that uh, the um, uh, the fuel economy is good and um, uh, other advantages accrue from that now, uh, when the uh, uh, mass flow rate requirement or the thrust requirement reduces, the uh, rotational speed of the uh, rotor also uh, decreases. So all these factors tend to make uh, uh, changes in the operating condition. For instance, we said that under design operating condition, the axial velocity remains constant. Now, uh, when the mass flow requirement or the RPM requirement of the engine changes or RPM of the uh, engine changes, the axial velocity will also have to change. And uh, how do we handle this change in axial velocity? Because typically, the uh, uh, velocity uh, triangle is such that when the air uh, approaches uh, a rotor blade, either here or here, uh, the uh, uh, relative, the absolute velocity should be such that the relative velocity vector is tangential to the uh, blade profile uh, at entry and at exit also. So uh, when the velocity changes, the um, uh, axial velocity changes, the uh, flow at entry will no longer be um, a tangential to the blade surface. So for instance, you know, at um, a design operating condition, the inlet velocity vector, relative velocity vector is tangential to this. And because uh, the axial component of the relative velocity, Cx, is the same as the axial component of the absolute velocity, Vx, any change in Vx also causes a change in Cx. So design operating condition, the relative velocity vector is tangential at entry. But if there is a change, then um, the uh, relative velocity vector will no longer look like this. It may perhaps look like this. If it looks like this, then as you can see, the flow separates from a certain part of the upper portion of the plate. Now, instead of being like this, if the relative velocity changes like this, then we can see that there is going to be separated flow in a certain part of the uh, blade surface on the lower side. Okay, so both these change the uh, relative velocity at the outlet also, and this uh, can cause a compressor stall, uh, resulting in uh, very poor performance or unsteady uh, performance of the compressor, which is very dangerous from a mechanical perspective also. So we need to have a, an effective strategy by which we can handle uh, changes in the axial component of the velocity. Okay, since uh, Cx equal to Vx, any change in uh, axial component Vx due to uh, a change in mass flow rate definitely translates to a change in the uh, axial component of the relative velocity and can cause non-tangential uh, entry into the rotor. Okay?
So one way to do this in a multi-stage compressor is, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we can make these uh, stationary uh, veins or guide veins movable. So when the uh, um, when the absolute velocity uh, changes, or axial component uh, the absolute velocity changes, uh, the absolute magnitude of the absolute velocity and uh, the flow angle can also change. So the idea is to reorient these uh, uh, stator veins in such a way that even with the reduced axial velocity, the blades uh, can still be I'm sorry, the flow can still be made to enter uh, the uh, following rotor stage with the relative velocity aligned with the direction of the uh, blade tangent. Okay, so the, such a strategy is called a, a, a variable guide vane strategy, and this is quite widely used in aircraft engines. So we see the variable guide vanes here in a Rolls Royce engine. And uh, uh, it can be seen that these guide vanes are uh, attached to the casing in such a manner that uh, you know they can be pivoted about this point and they can be moved this way or that way, depending upon the change in the uh, axial component of velocity or mass flow rate. So as we said earlier, the mass flow rate requirement of the engine decreases as the uh, aircraft climbs. And once the aircraft starts descending, the mass flow rate requirement begins to increase as more thrust is required. Uh, so uh, consequently, these variable guide winds may be moved in both ways to uh, make sure that the flow that enters the following rotor uh, is always tangential to the, uh, the relative component is always tangential to the uh, blade at entry into the following rotor. So you can see how the variable stator veins adjust the absolute flow angle so that the relative velocity vector enters the following rotor passage tangentially. Okay. So this allows a considerable variation uh, or considerable departure from design operating condition and still uh, avoid uh, 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 compressor stalling under such circumstances. Another strategy uh, that is used in the case of uh, aircraft engines is the following. Okay, so here, as we can see, this is a turbofan engine. There is a huge fan in the front, which uh, generates about 75 to uh, nearly 85% of the thrust. Okay? The rest of the engine generates only the remaining uh, thrust. So the fan being uh, uh, so large and having such a large outer diameter needs to turn uh, as slowly as possible so that the centrifugal stresses in the blade are minimized. Okay? On the other hand, as the air flows through the uh, subsequent compressor stages, when it reaches the uh, tail end of the compressor, these blades become so small that they need to spin at a high speed just to get the flow through the blade passage. Okay, So there is a wide variation in the desired RPM of uh, various parts of the compressor. So the fan needs to run as slowly as possible and uh, high pressure stages need to run as uh, fast as possible to get the flow going through the stages uh, as smoothly as possible while keeping the axial velocity, absolute axial velocity constant. So there is a differing requirement here. So it uh, suggests that uh, different parts of the compressor should then be mounted on different shafts or spools as they are called, so that each one can turn at its own optimal speed. And this is a strategy that is widely used in aircraft engines. This is called multi-spool, okay? So the fan uh, being uh, large in size and having a large outer diameter should run, run at the lowest possible RPM so that the centrifugal stresses are minimized, plus the tip speed also is minimized as much as possible, okay? Uh, the fan tip speed in most modern uh, turbo fans actually uh, are such that the relative velocity approaches the blade at supersonic speeds, or at least transonic speeds. So reducing this as much as possible is always desirable, okay? And because the power requirement of this fan is so high, we need about five to seven turbine stages just to run the fan. Now the intermediate and high pressure compressors uh, are located uh, uh, downstream of the fan. So as the gas is compressed, its volume decreases and the height of the blade also uh, decreases. Uh, 
So the RPM consequently has to go up for maintaining a constant axial velocity. Because we designed this with a constant axial velocity, the uh, uh, RPM has to go up for maintaining a constant axial velocity. Uh, the power requirement here is lesser, so only one or two turbine stages are required to uh, drive this. Okay, so because of the widely differing uh, RPM requirements, the different uh, uh, parts of the engine, like the low pressure, intermediate pressure, and high pressure compressors, are mounted on different shafts. So each combination, the driving turbine and the driven compressor operates at an optimum speed. So for example, this is the Rolls-Royce uh, three-spool uh, engine. And you can see that the fan is mounted on a separate shaft, uh, which is uh, driven by about uh, uh, five turbine stages. Typically, this runs at a speed of around 3000 RPM. Uh, the next one, which is the intermediate uh, pressure uh, compressor, uh, several rows, eight compressor stages, so the intermediate pressure compressor are run by one turbine stage, and this runs at higher speed of about 7,500 RPM. Now, the high pressure compressor, which has about six stages, is run by, again, one turbine stage. This usually runs at 10,000 RPM or so. So this is usually the outermost shaft, so this shaft is hollow, so the IP shaft IP stage shaft runs inside this, it's concentric and runs inside this shaft and the fan shaft runs inside these two shafts. So uh, these are uh, three shafts mounted coaxially and concentrically and uh, uh, because they each unit, the compressor plus turbine unit can run at an optimal speed, it is possible to uh, uh, operate at off design operating conditions in a very robust manner. Uh, while retaining the uh, highest possible efficiency that we see at design operating condition. So this allows aircraft, modern aircraft engines to be very, very efficient and uh, give excellent uh, fuel economy, uh, making, making it possible for uh, widespread air travel that we, are, uh, that we are witnessing today. Another strategy that is used uh, is a counter rotating turbine. Okay, so here what is done is uh, instead of making these individual spools all turn in the same or rotate in the same direction, we can actually make one set of uh, spool run in the opposite direction to the following set of spools. So this may spin in this direction, this may spin in this direction. The advantage in uh, doing it like this is that uh, we can eliminate one uh, set of uh, guide vanes in between the spools, which reduces the weight and also increases the aerodynamic efficiency of the entire uh, turbine compressor system. So you can see that here this turbine spins uh, in this direction, this turbine spins in this direction. So the corresponding uh, uh, compressor uh, blades, which are mounted on the same spool, also run in op uh, opposite directions. So this allows uh, uh, a set of guide vanes to be removed uh, in between these poles by reducing the weight and increasing the aerodynamic efficiency. That's other beneficial effects because if the weight can be reduced, then uh, uh, the uh, power to weight ratio improves. And uh, in an aircraft engine application, the power to weight ratio of the engine is the most critical uh, parameter for, uh, from an operational perspective. So uh, again, uh, I urge uh, students to actually go and um, look at this uh, YouTube video that I had suggested earlier. This is illustrated there in a uh, very uh, nice manner. So far, uh, we have seen the uh, challenges uh, that are faced in, a, uh, in an axial compressor when it uh, uh, has to operate under off-design operating conditions. And as we said, this uh, happens more in the aircraft engines. So let us now uh, look at the challenges uh, that are faced in the turbine side uh, of uh, aircraft engines on uh, what uh, steps are usually taken to overcome these uh, challenges. Uh, the most important challenge uh, uh, from the uh, turbine side lies in designing the, uh, the high pressure turbine stage. As we just saw, the high pressure turbine stage spins at the highest possible RPM and it um, uh, faces the highest pressure and highest temperature in the cycle uh, because it is just downstream of the combustor. Uh, 
So consequently, the high pressure uh, turbine blades are the most vulnerable from a design perspective. And um, uh, the challenges faced here are more from a metallurgical and material perspective uh, rather than from an aerodynamic perspective. Now, we have already seen uh, that uh, uh, since the pressure gradient is favorable uh, in a turbine, we can have very high uh, pressure drops or enthalpy drops without any problem. Uh, unlike a compressor where there is always a danger of separation even at design conditions uh, if the pressure ratio is too high. So uh, there is no, uh, in that sense, the challenge, aerodynamic challenges on the turbine side are not perhaps as uh, severe as they are uh, on the compressor side, but the metallurgical and material uh, challenges are uh, quite severe in the case of the uh, high pressure turbine. So this operates at the highest pressure, temperature and RPM. So it's a very challenging uh, environment to operate in because the operating temperature 1700 Kelvin is about 400 degrees higher than the blade metal melting temperature. The, the turbine blade metal uh, melting temperature is 400 degrees less than the temperature at which it operates. Uh, so uh, the blade needs to be cooled very, uh, uh, very well, otherwise it will melt. So very effective blade cooling strategies are required. And uh, because of these operating conditions, fatigue and creep are major concerns. Okay, So uh, we need innovative materials uh, for the manufacture of the turbine uh, blade itself and manufacturing techniques you know, such as uh, uh, single crystal blades and so on are required. And coatings such as uh, thermal barrier coating made of ceramics are also used to uh, prevent the blade from melting. So blade cooling, uh, better materials, better manufacturing techniques, all these are uh, challenges from a metallurgical and material perspective in the case of turbines. And aerodynamic challenges probably are not, as I said, as severe as they are in the case of an axial compressor. Okay. But all these uh, challenges uh, they, uh, have been uh, overcome or addressed very effectively in modern aircraft engines, which consequently are extremely uh, efficient in terms of uh, fuel consumption uh, at the highest possible levels.